In this section, we'll be introducing the double spend problem and then moving on to how does Bitcoin solve it. Okay, so that's just a little bit of color, a little bit of background as to the traditional financial system, right? We still live in this world, still runs most of the modern world, um, but maybe that's starting to change with the idea of digital cash. So I'll hand this one out in a moment. Um, but for now, we're just looking at some ideas here that have contributed to digital cash and showing that the ideas go back to the 1980s where people, so remember databases got really good in the 1970s. Computers were started, developed in the 50s and 60s, 1970s databases. 1980s, we started to get like um, cheaper computing, networked computing, you know, not necessarily internet, but networked computing. Um, and people were starting to do mathematics that previously it didn't seem possible in the computer. So that includes things like cryptography. So one of the fathers here of digital cash is a cryptographer named David Chome. And he started early with this idea of how can we make money such that it's in a digital form and still works like money that we're used to today. So I said here, does it sound hard? I mean, it sounds, I guess on first approach, you think, yeah, why do, you know, do, why do we not have money that works like our traditional finance system? Um, so one thing that leads into this, uh, that contributes to this is the digital abundance in this case, it's a problem. And another thing particularly relevant to blockchains is the double spend problem. So some attempts that we've seen before are DigiCash in 1989. So we have offline eCash. We have B-Money in 98. David Chaum here, he kind of made a real thing, um, but it wasn't necessarily decentralized. B money is more of a thought experiment or an essay. It wasn't actually built. And then another one that comes up a lot is Bitgold, which sort of starts to sound now like Bitcoin, meaning that gold is a good store of value, well known throughout history. Uh, so Bitgold and Bitcoin. Uh, this guy, Nick Szabo, is sometimes thought to perhaps be or have some close ties to the pseudonymous creator of Bitcoin. Uh, the anonymous creator of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto. Okay, so digital cash, why is it so hard? So the double spend problem is related to this idea of counterfeiting. So double spending, it's, it's as it sounds, like can you spend a $50 note and then spend it again? And it's like, well, if it's cash, you have to give that note to someone else and then it's theirs. So you can't go take it from them and spend it again. So if you were to try to double spend physical Banknotes, you could try to counterfeit them. Um, and you know, it's, this, is, this is well known by the banks that perhaps people might try to counterfeit money, print their own money. Uh, and so the way around this is to create some security features and put it into your notes. And you know, nowadays there's like holograms on them and they're like made of mylar and they're like, they're transparent bits and micro printing and all sorts of weird things. Uh, the Americans, they put like a, they, they like embed like a strip into their notes. Um, so they make it so that it's very hard to copy. Physically, it's difficult to copy. And so I say it's related to double spending, um, this idea of counterfeiting, which could let you spend money that really um, you didn't earn in like a zero sum game. The digital portion is related to this idea that it's really easy to copy and paste stuff. So digital abundance, just an idea of the digital trajectory here. Uh, in 2009, it was, you know, 11 and a half cents for a gigabyte of storage. So you go out and you buy a USB stick or you get your new phone. That's about what you're paying for storage. Uh, nowadays, it is one and a half cents. So that's a whole order of magnitude in 14 years the storage has. So this is like an exponential decay in the cost of storage, and that is indicative of how easy it is to copy and paste data online or to create data and store it um, in, a, in a persistent fashion. And like this chart's gonna keep going, right? If we were to zoom in for the next 14 years, we'll probably see the same thing, where storage per gigabyte will go down another 
order of magnitude. So if you're making digital money, make a digital note. Let's say it's a digital note. You put like some Adobe PDF protections on it, some digital rights management. You're like, yeah, it's copyrighted. You can't edit it, right? But the problem is that it's so easy to copy everything that's online. And this has kind of like been an, uh, an ongoing problem for people that create valuable things, right? Your music, your art, your, your movies, right? Sony Studios gets hacked and their video gets leaked. Uh, uh, you know, big issue, big issue for them. You can imagine how tricky it would be if someone tried to create digital money and it was fallible in this way that you could copy it. Right, so how do banks prevent you from double spending themselves? So in terms of the notes we talked about, it's kind of related. It's very hard to counterfeit a note. But what about the banks? Most of our money is online in a bank account. Uh, you know, surely with some tech savvy skills, we should be able to manipulate this. So banks, they do a few things. The first thing they do is they take their profits and they invest it in their buildings. So they have the biggest building in town. Uh, and it's very nice when you walk inside. Uh, this is, this view is maybe getting a bit outdated, but you know banks are always on the uh, on the main corner and the main street in the city, and they're the tallest building to really show you that they have this presence. And what they're doing there is they're telling everyone that they can be trusted. So the trust is how banks in their centralized manner do it. Uh, the other thing they do is buy physical by physically storing the valuable things inside of a vault uh, and uh, centralizing this process. You, of course, could store your own wealth in a vault, but it might be expensive and difficult to build your own vault. And you know, banks are very good at this. It's actually pretty cheap to use a bank, right? They'll, they'll probably let you in for no fees or like less than $50 or something. Happy to sign you up and get you in the door. And they're very good at keeping your money. It's very rare that your money gets stolen from a bank. Uh, there might even be insurance in case there is a physical breach and someone steals money from, from the bank. Right? So, so in this sense, banks are good, lots of trust. Uh, physically, they're very impressive. But they're not digital, are, are they? Right? So what do we do if we want it to be digital and decentralized? Um, so again, the banks are all centralized. All the profits flow up the org chart to the top. Um, you know, whether it's China Construction Bank or uh, uh, RBS, Royal Bank of Scotland, or HSBC, right? Whatever the biggest bank of the moment is, all those profits flow up, and it's very centralized. So we're trying here to take money, remove the bank, or remove that middleman, that middlewoman, take her out so that we can all share in the splendor, OK? So to get this idea of a distributed, decentralized system, we've got a poker analogy. Uh, so you may have seen or played poker. Hopefully you've ever and maybe or maybe not played poker. Um, game of cards, right, between friends. And you're going to exchange money. And you know at the end, someone's going to walk away with all of it. So if we are playing poker among friends, one way to do it is with poker chips, or with coins, or with cash. You have a stack, and you split it up depending on how the cards fall. Now, if you don't have chips, what you need to do is you need to write down who has what. It's kind of like a schoolyard game, right? Kids can play poker. You just got to keep track of who's winning the hand and who has all the chips. And then when you don't have any more chips, you got to say, like, sorry, Jeff, you're out of the game. Like you. If it's written down right here, you don't have any more chips. You don't have any more credits in order to play. So just like keeping track of the score in a game, this is a ledger. Okay. The way that it works between players at the table is you can see everyone. I could see everyone here. And if it's a small enough table, right, you can physically see if someone's trying to subvert the system and take off with chips. In a really big game, you need some sort of ledger system where everyone's writing down what everyone else has. And that's why all these ledgers are the same. You don't just want to keep track of your score, but the whole tables. So this is a distributed system where we don't have like cash that's produced by a central bank. 
Okay, so we've got a distributed system. How do we prevent double spending in a digital manner? And so this is the topic of the next section. How does Bitcoin solve this problem?